have a friend who thinks prayer is sending positive thoughts into the universe. I talk to a lot of people that think about praying but wonder if anyone's listening. I have a friend that doesn't pray because she just doesn't think it works. I pray for snow days. I have friends who pray but only when they need God to get them out of trouble. I know I should be praying, but sometimes I just don't want to. Honestly, prayer used to be me telling God what I wanted, but that usually didn't work out too well. Recently I was talking to a friend who was really disappointed because their prayers weren't answered and ultimately they just felt that prayer was a waste of time. Well, welcome to this new series uh, we're calling I Have a Friend Who? And we'll be studying some challenging issues that we all struggle with either directly or indirectly and all of these issues have one thing in common. And that is that all these issues can be difficult to talk about in church. And that's why believers, when it comes to these issues, uh, often instead will say, I have this friend who, I have this friend who has a marriage that's falling apart. I have a friend who has given up on God. I have a friend who has serious doubts about prayer. That's our topic today, uh, prayer, because uh, everybody has struggles when it comes to prayer. Everybody uh, has doubts and questions about prayer, except for me. I don't have any prayer struggles, but I do have a friend who <laughs> wonders if prayer is a waste of time. My friend says, What's the point in praying? Usually nothing happens. If I got a car and I turn the ignition and usually nothing happens, I would say, this car doesn't work. It's the same with prayer. Usually nothing happens. It doesn't work. Prayer doesn't work. That's what I'm tempted to think. I mean, my friend is tempted to <laughs> think. Thankfully, God has something to say about this big prayer problem because God came to earth in the person of Jesus and Jesus taught about prayer. Taught us about prayer, including Jesus gave us a sample prayer where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, uh, beginning at verse 9, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you say, great prayer, but it doesn't answer the prayer not working question. Well, actually, Jesus does answer the question throughout his prayer, but especially in those first two words, our Father. Those first two words, our Father, they become so familiar to us that we miss the impact of the fact that Jesus is teaching us to refer to Almighty God who has no beginning, has no end, the creator of all things, refer to God as Father. Jesus was teaching something that had never been taught anywhere by anyone anytime before he uh, said this in his prayer. Jesus scandalized the religious leaders of his day by this informality toward God. They were scandalized, not because Jesus taught us to call God Father alone, but listen to this. The ear witnesses who recorded this prayer of Jesus, the gospel writers, uh, they make it clear that the word that Jesus actually used for father is the Aramaic word, that's the word, that's the language Jesus spoke, Aramaic, the Aramaic word Abba, which was the word little kids used for their father and means dad 
or daddy. That's it. Jesus taught us to pray and refer to Almighty God as dad. And then Jesus follows up those first two words, our dad in heaven. He follows it up with six or seven aspects of prayer and how it should reflect this daddy relationship. Uh, And in the process, Jesus teaches that prayer is not getting God to give me what I want. Prayer is a multifaceted conversation with a heavenly dad who wants a love relationship with me as his favored child. So this is how Jesus answers the accusation, prayer doesn't work. Jesus teaches that this idea that prayer is supposed to work by getting God to give me what I want is a total misunderstanding of God's purpose and intent for prayer. When God came to earth in Jesus, he taught that prayer is not slipping coins into a slot in order to get God to give me what I want, but prayer is part of, the, of, of a loving relationship with God, the conversation of listening and talking to God in prayer. And this being true, I bet God is a little put out by people who go around saying, prayer doesn't work. But listen to this, I think even more God is a little put out by believers who go around proclaiming, prayer really works. I prayed about my business deal and it came through. See, prayer really works. I put up my timeshare and it sold above asking price. See, prayer really works. I don't, I don't think God likes that. I mean, uh, I have uh, twins, a son and a daughter, who uh, have just gone to college, and uh, they've gone to the same college. Now, let's say that I just, in the first three weeks that they are at college, I hear through the grapevine that they are known for uh, going around campus, uh, giving their fellow students a tip, saying, hey, if you want some extra spending money, this is what you do. You call your dad and then make a little small talk and then ask for some cash. We did it and it works. (laughs) I, as a dad, I'd be a little insulted uh, because I want my kids to call me because they love me. I want them to talk to me because they like being with me. Not because it's a way to get what they want. And let me just add, you know, emphasize, this is a sermon illustration. My kids don't actually advocate uh, calling dad for extra money because they know that it would you know, hurt my heart and because they know it doesn't work. So uh, maybe God has, says the same thing about, uh, about prayer. That doesn't work because God's purpose for prayer is not dragging out from him what I want Prayer is intended to be this multifaceted conversation that builds my relationship with God. What do I mean by a multifaceted conversation? Well, read on in Jesus' sample prayer. And notice the different aspects of prayer. Jesus prays, hallowed is your name, which means that prayer is not just about getting Prayer is actually giving to God, giving him the praise and joyful worship and gratitude and thanks he deserves. Next, Jesus says, your kingdom come, which means that prayer implies listening, listening to God's heartbeat and his plan, and then uh, praying to participate in uh, what he wants to do and sharing his kingdom, love and joy and peace in this earthly existence and in my world. And then, forgive me as I forgive others, which shows that prayer is receiving God's healing love and forgiveness in a way that 
that same grace and mercy overflows from me into all my relationships and then lead me not into temptation, which shows that prayer is not just seeking to get stuff from God, it's seeking God and seeking to know God and his wisdom and his power and his, uh, his uh, filling in my life. And then just notice also that there is that phrase about asking God for material needs. Uh, that phrase, give us today our daily bread. But just notice how asking God for material needs is one small aspect of the multifaceted conversation that prayer is intended to be. So when people say prayer doesn't work, they're showing that they don't understand that God's purpose for prayer is so much more than just getting stuff or getting God to do stuff. And you say, okay, 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 I, I get the point. But there's another big problem with prayer that comes up in Jesus' sample prayer when he says, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, I have this friend who wonders, since God's will prevails, why bother asking in prayer? I mean, you get the problem, right? God is God. God doesn't just wish for certain things to happen. Whatever God wants to happen, happens. And so my prayer requests don't change anything. Uh, and if my prayers don't change anything, why pray? I'm asking, I mean, my friend is asking a simple question. Uh, which is it, Jesus? Which is it? Does God's will prevail, or do my simple prayer requests make a difference? It has to be one or the other, right? So Jesus, which is it? Well, based on my study of Scripture, I believe Jesus would say it is both. Because everywhere in Scripture, Jesus always affirms God's will is sovereign, always prevails. And Jesus always affirms that my prayers make a difference. God's unchanging will and my world-changing prayer, Jesus affirms that they are both true at the same time. And I can hear some of you from a scientific background saying, well, isn't that convenient? The two truths that are totally contradictory and mutually exclusive, and they're both true at the same time. I'm so glad that in science, that never happens. Not so fast. I'm no scientist, but those who are tell me that some of the most simple physical realities that we experience every day can only be explained by holding competing truths at the same time. Take something as simple as light. Well, it turns out that when you try to explain light scientifically, it's not so simple. Scientifically speaking, sometimes light's property and behavior can only be described as a wave. And sometimes light's property and behavior can only be described as a particle. So which is it? Is light a wave or is light a particle? It has to be one or the other, right? So which is it, Einstein? Well, quantum mechanics resolve the dispute by saying that these contradictory theories are both true. And they call it the wave-particle duality. But don't listen to me. Listen to Einstein, uh, who says, we are faced with a new kind of difficulty. We have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explains the phenomena of light. But together, they do. Now, Albert doesn't look very excited about this duality, <laughs> but I am. Uh, apparently, light is so far above human understanding that we can only conceive of it by holding together what seem to be contradictory truths at the same time. And if simple light demands this kind of humility from me, 
How much more should we expect a relationship with the creator of light to involve things we don't fully understand and ask us to hold together two truths that seem in our limited view to be contradictory? God's unchanging will and my world-changing prayer. Jesus says they are both true at the same time time. In Einstein's words, uh, separately, neither of them fully explains my relationship with God, but together they do. If I'm going to have a relationship with the God who created light in a word, I must be humble enough to accept some mysteries, including the mystery of prayer. You could say that prayer is that exciting place where my human ordinariness and the all-powerful, all-loving extraordinariness of God come together. Prayer is that mysterious meeting place between ordinary me and the extraordinary, infinite, holy, eternal God. So I should expect to encounter some mystery on my knees in prayer. Uh, so I, early, I mentioned earlier my twins uh, who were born uh, at Bridgeport Hospital on a bitter cold uh, January day 18 years ago. Several days after bringing Parker and Kaylee home, it became clear that our newborn daughter had picked up a serious respiratory virus in the hospital. And uh, the virus caused nasal congestion, severe nasal congestion, which sounds innocent enough, but uh, it turns out that it's actually life-threatening for newborns. I didn't know this then. I still don't understand it. But newborns can't draw air by mouth. They only breathe by nose. So this nasal congestion grew more and more severe, and our newborn daughter was arching and straining uh, for air and struggling to survive. So Kaylee was rushed to the hospital where she was placed in uh, neonatal intensive care. And for days, uh, Jen stayed with Kaylee in the hospital by herself because I had to care for Parker, uh, who couldn't be near his contagious sister. In that newborn ICU, our girl was kept in a crib uh, surrounded by metal bars hooked up to tubes and straining for breath. Jen was just dazed from giving birth with all the hormones and the weakness. Jen was alone and separated from me and her newborn son in the hospital room with a daughter who was in a cage hovering between life and death. And Jen says she lost it. She broke down. And in the midst of her sobs, all she could do was whisper a prayer. God, please show me your love. God, I know there's a blizzard outside. There's nobody that can come. Nobody's around. But God, please give me a sign of your presence. Please give me some encouragement. Some encouragement. And Jen says that moments later, she regained composure, and a man walked into her hospital room. And he looked like he had just come in from the blizzard outside. And he said, hi, my name is Michael, and uh, I just became a Christ follower. Uh, Just last week, uh, I was at Black Rock and received Jesus with a pastor. And I was going by, and I remembered uh, somebody saying that your daughter was here. And I don't really know if God does this, because I'm new at this. But uh, it seemed like God was telling me that you needed some encouragement. And Jen said, did you say encouragement? And when Michael said, yeah, encouragement, Jen just fell into joyful hysteria with laughter and sobbing and praising God and thanking God right there. Michael was only there for a few moments, but Michael's arrival in the hospital room right after Jen's prayer communicated to her so powerfully God's personal love and personal presence in a way that she will never, ever forget. Now let's step back and analyze this event. Um, Jen, uh, she had this uh, need for 
encouragement in a desperate way. She prayed for encouragement, and minutes later, God brought encouragement in just the way that she needed it. Here's one question. How important was the asking part? Uh, If Jen had not prayed, would God have not prompted Michael to stop by? I don't know. But here's what I do know. I know that it was Jen's asking in prayer that made Michael's visit a miraculous God moment for her. Because she prayed for encouragement, and when it came minutes later, she experienced God's love for her and God's personal presence with her in a way that she would never have experienced if she had not prayed. When I ask in prayer and God responds, it melts my heart and builds this daddy relationship with God that God so wants to develop in me. And maybe this is part of the mystery of why God calls me over and over in Scripture to just ask. To ask and ask him, he says. More than anything, God wants to communicate his daddy love for me as his favorite child in a way that changes my life and empowers me to change the lives of others. When I ask God in prayer, I suddenly see God in ways that I never would have otherwise. If I do not ask, I miss the mystery of God's unchanging will and my world-changing prayer coming together. Another mystery for Jen was that she didn't see Michael ever again. And Black Rock is a big church, but Jen still wondered if maybe Michael was an angel. I didn't have the heart to tell her that I saw Michael at church all the time. (laughs) And that the hysteria in the hospital room, he was kind of keeping his distance a little bit. He never says the word encouragement anymore. But uh, Jen had a miracle of of, uh, someone coming at just the time uh, that she needed encouragement. And Michael had the miracle, that's uh, the other part of prayer, which is receiving promptings from, from God. But you know, as we analyze this story, there's another possibility. There's the possibility that it was all just coincidence. Jen prayed for encouragement, and by coincidence, Michael felt a need to stop by with some encouragement. But it's all just a coincidence. When it comes to coincidence, I've come to... uh, agree with a 19th century uh, pastor named Charles Spurgeon who loved talking about how in prayer God had him in just the right place at the right time with the right word of encouragement for people. And to those who would snort and say, it's all just coincidence, Spurgeon loved to reply, all I can tell you is when I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. When I pray, coincidences happen. So I'm wondering, would you be willing to conduct a little prayer experiment? Here's the experiment. Uh, Set your phone to remind you to pray for two minutes at 2 p.m. and do it for two weeks. I say two minutes because Jesus' sample prayer takes less than two minutes to pray, which means that you can worship and listen and receive and seek God in less than two minutes and still have some time left over to bring to God your biggest need of the moment. Do this two-minute prayer at two o'clock for two weeks and see if you don't notice more coincidences in your life. Over and over in Scripture, Jesus says, trust me, prayer makes a difference. Like in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. If you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your father, your dad in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him. So get your phone and 
set for 2 p.m. But here's something you can do before 2 p.m. today. You can have someone pray for you before you leave the building. So just as you exit this room, you're going to go out uh, one of these doors and you're going to head toward the cafe. And right by the cafe is a prayer room. And you'll find a friendly prayer team member there with a badge. And that person is going to be ready to pray with you. Just mention your need. They'll pray for you. And it'll take about 90 seconds. Uh, but it's so powerful to just have someone lift you up in prayer. Prayer is not a waste of time because God promises that he always answers prayer. That's right. God always answers prayer. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is just you wait. And there are prayers where God always answers yes, always. I'm thinking of the prayer where I began my dad relationship with God. There are no magic words to say, but in a simple prayer, I just whispered to Jesus, I believe you died on the cross uh, to give me the gift of forgiveness that restores my relationship with God. Jesus, I believe I receive the gift and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. God always answers yes to that prayer, which is the most important prayer you can pray because it starts your relationship with your dad in heaven. And it's a prayer that you can pray with one of the prayer team members in the uh, prayer room. Now, there's also examples of prayers that God always says no to. Uh, These are prayers uh, that are not good for me or they're not part of God's best plan for me. Ruth, the wife of a well-known preacher, Billy Graham, uh, was fond of saying, uh, I'm so thankful uh, that God says no to some prayers or I would have married the wrong man five times. (laughs) Finally, you know, sometimes God does not answer no and does not answer yes. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, we read about a man who fell at Jesus' feet and said, I have run for miles and miles because my son is dying. Jesus, will you heal him? And uh, Jesus did not offer to go with this dad, but instead said to the dad, I hear your love uh, for your son and honor your request. Your son will be healed. Uh, Do you know what happened next? A long walk home. The dad was in a position where he didn't know whether his prayer was uh, answered or not until he got home and saw his son well and healed. It's the same for you. Sometimes you pray and God will not act in minutes, not in months, not in years. Maybe you will only see the answer down, way down the road, and you'll see the answer in the rearview mirror. Maybe you won't see the answer in this life at all. Maybe you won't see the answer until you get home. Maybe when you see Jesus face to face, your eyes will suddenly brim with wonder and tears and say, oh, When I prayed, that happened, and that led to that, and all of that, and this prayer, and that prayer, and all these prayers were answered in ways that I could never imagine. Wow. So don't give up in prayer. Prayers you thought God did not answer, God has answered with just you Wait, and one day you will realize with tears of joy and wonder that the prayers you pray today were definitely not a waste of time. We want to thank you for watching and listening to our sermons online, and we hope that uh, you will be inspired to live more like Jesus through these. Please check out blackrock.org for more information about our church. Know that you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And also uh, know that you can give uh, to BlackRock and to our ministry through PushPay, through our mobile app, and on our website. Your uh, donations and your support of our ministry allows us to have 
uh, these videos online and for us to impact our community.